Uh, good afternoon. I'm going to get us started here. If I could have your attention, please. <laughs> or not. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's good. I'm glad to see everybody so lively. We're now entering the drowsy session of the afternoon. So I'm glad to hear everybody's so full of life. Uh, so I'd like to, um, I'd like to start uh, by way of introducing this panel. The first start by introducing myself. My name is Lyndon Estes. I'm, in a, I'm a research scientist here at Princeton. And my work focuses on understanding the impacts and sustainability of agricultural land use change in sub-Saharan Africa. So um, I'm moderating this panel today, which is uh, entitled Changing Course, Food System Study at Princeton. And before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to give a, little, a quick, very quick motivation for the, for the purpose of this panel. Um, as most of you by now gathered uh, from sitting in this room, that our, our food systems, um, <coughs> along many dimensions, present a range of critical and increasing challenges to sustainability. Now, the subject of this symposium today, uh, which is the connection between our dietary choices and climate change, is one dimension uh, of, of, of this sort of sustainability challenge that food systems pose. We've heard others during the course of today. Uh, the impact that our food systems are having on biodiversity is one. Dan Rubenstein mentioned some of this. The uh, impact of food systems on human health is another. So <clears throat> there are many challenges, uh, but one thing that these uh, food system challenges all have in common is that finding solutions to any one of these uh, will require uh, very, uh, a very transdisciplinary approach to finding solutions. A, 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 you would need a range of academic disciplines all contributing together to find answers to this. That involves natural sciences, social sciences, the, the humanities. And you also need a cross-sectoral approach uh, across all sectors of society. That's from the political to the civil society, to, uh, to the, uh, to the um, private, private business sphere. And I think you've seen some of that with the panel uh, representations here. So now Princeton University is actually quite well positioned to undertake this type of interdisciplinary research. We have faculty and students and staff that uh, engage in a number of different aspects of this work. Um, and so the in initiative that Princeton Studies Food has tried to start in the, the past several years is to draw together this work and build on it and develop a coherent program of food studies at Princeton. So the focus of this panel today will be uh, looking at what are the next steps, what can we do to build that program here at Princeton. And so with that, I'd like to first introduce our panelists. Um, we have on the left uh, a Professor David Wilkove. Um, he is a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology and public affairs here. So he has a joint appointment in EEB and Woodrow Wilson School. And I have to thank David for bringing me here to Princeton. He hired me when I, when I, to get me first here. <laughs> to my, next, next to him is uh, Professor Steve Bacala, who is the Frederick D. Petrie Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And then over here we have uh, Professor Forrest Meggers, who is uh, in the School of Architecture and the Andlinger Center for uh, Energy and Environment. So, what I've done is I've asked uh, each of these professors to take five minutes to give a brief overview of their research and teaching, focusing particularly on th those aspects of their research and teaching programs that focus on food systems. So I think I'm going to start uh, by giving uh, uh, Professor Pakala the, the, the floor, since, and uh, after we hear from them, we'll open it up to questions for the audience. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to deliver what I suspect will be an unpopular message. Um, the, this doesn't come from my uh, research. It comes from my teaching. I'm teaching a course called the Environmental Nexus um, right now for the first time with a bunch of other people. Um, and the, the, the course was sufficiently outside my domain of research that I spent a year actually reading the literature. First time I've done anything like that since graduate school. And, um, and have come to some conclusions that, that I want to share with you about the food problem. So the environmental nexus um, is the confluence of the climate, food, water, freshwater, and biodiversity problems that I have, uh, that I think are uh, unique in the threat they pose to humanity. And that all come to a head about mid-century when the gap between the danger that they pose, the harms that they create, and humanity's capacity to uh, adapt 
is at its greatest point, all right? And it's also the time at which today's undergraduates are at sort of peak of power and responsibility. So the course is designed to equip students with what they need to know to make decisions for themselves about what they want to do about this. And this is a problem where, you know, deciding to be a unibomber and hide from it, withdraw from the world, is not really an option because the problem comes for you, right? Comes, comes after you. All right. And, and of course, the food problem, as you know, is that although the human population only grows a little bit between now and 2050, the demand for food under some of any kind of business as usual calculation approximately doubles. All right. Now, what I, what I want to emphasize, and I'm sure it's been emphasized before uh, uh, during the conference, is that these four problems constrain one another so that a solution for one can't be considered in the absence of the solutions for the others. Right. So the solution set is actually much smaller for the union of these problems than it is for each problem considered separately. Now, the food problem, the biggest piece of the food problem is, um, is, is shown in this slide. Um, what you've got here is GDP per capita on the horizontal axis, and you have the proportion of, um, of, uh, uh, of land um, that is um, uh, the share of cereals used as human food in red versus livestock food in blue, all right? And what you can see is, is that people become wealthy. More and more of the yields on croplands is, in fact, going to people's craving for meat, all right? Now, the, this presents an intractable problem because, as you know, the efficiency of raising uh, beef is, is low, any, any kind of meat is low. And the alternative is actually to change people's diets, which is slow. And the problem with the environmental nexus problems is that the peak of danger is only 33 years hence. And I'm just not at all confident that we're going to convince humanity to, to, to substantially shift their diets over that period. On the margin, sure. But I just can't, you know, if we were going to actually do it, if we were actually going to meet the food demand by shifting people's diets, then every five-year-old would have to be a vegetarian already, all right? And they are. Now, um, the, the reason this interacts with um, the, the, the extinction problem is that it's possible to calculate how many species you lose as a result of the agricultural expansion you would need if you wanted to meet this doubled demand by doubled crop production. And it roughly wipes out the tropical forest. And there's a little note at the bottom that says to the students, you're not going to be responsible for this. But there's a way to make a calculation. Um, and it's consistent with uh, uh, what I took from Dave Wilco's lecture on this um, in, in uh, ENV 202, 201. And so what I get is about 60% of species uh, that go extinct if you actually do that agricultural expansion, uh, in contrast to 33% that would be killed just by business as usual climate change. And interestingly, the solution that we have of not expanding our agricultural land and implementing the Paris solution to climate change still knocks out about 11%, all right? So we still lose about a million. So that's, that's progress, but it's... Uh, uh, not much. Uh, this is a graph that comes from the recent IPCC, and what it shows is by um, uh, pairs of decades through the century, the expected changes in yields caused by climate change in locations and for different crops. And the, the red and, and amber colors mean yield decreases. The blue colors mean yield increases, and you can see that it starts at about 50-50 now and moves relentlessly under business as usual climate change towards reduced yields. And that means that unless you solve the climate problem, you really can't solve the food problem. Finally, of course, as you know, fresh water is highly limiting. Available fresh water is the tiny little dot there. The bigger dot is how much is in the oceans and so on. Um, and the available fresh water is already pretty well tapped out for 
uh, irrigation purposes. And so it's simply not the case that you can increase uh, uh, yield simply by increasing agricultural land into areas that are currently unsuited for crops because they aren't rain fed. Um, and indeed, climate change changes the water availability. This is a graph from the IPCC. Just focus on the one on the lower right-hand side. That's a business-as-usual scenario for late in the century. The red areas are all the areas that in, in, they experienced large decreases in soil moisture. And you'll see that they um, comprise most of the heavily agricultural regions of the world today. All right? Now, there are a bunch of new, there are a bunch of, of uh, solutions to this problem that have been published through the years. Uh, Foley in 2011 led a group that, that did a lot of this. Um, uh, you guys um, uh, highlighted that in the courses that, that you taught. And, and all of those solutions hinge on the same thing. That is that you can't really afford to expand farmland at all. And that means that you have to increase yields on existing croplands by a lot, basically to feed the animals that people crave. And I'm afraid what that means is that sort of healthy, low-intensity agriculture is just inconsistent with solving the climate and biodiversity problems. Intensive industrial agriculture is currently humanity's only option. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be niche markets for other kinds of agriculture, but it does, it is, it is sort of a bitter pill. It's a bitter pill like losing 11% of the species. So that's the hypothesis. And the alternative is some magic technological bullet, which I, as a technological geek, kind of expect. Um, or, or fundamentally changing people's attitudes, which would have to happen with unprecedented rapidity, and I just don't see it happening. So that's it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just, uh, okay. <laughs> so I'm here to be the optimist. <laughs> um, and tell you that I have the bullets that he was asking about. They're all, they're all here. We have all these magic silver bullets. Um, and what I'm going to do, instead of talking about any of the research I do, and, and similar to as, as Steve just alluded to, teaching classes, uh, in fact, to point out that the students, in this case, are the ones that do have most of those bullets, I would hope. And having taught Daniel last year, I know for a fact that in my class, which is designing sustainable systems, the objective being to try and think about the preposterous thing that might be the game changer um, and to push the limits in terms of, of thinking outside of the box and, and maybe finding some alternative modes of, of addressing some of these problems. Um, what my students did last year and I thought would be appropriate to show today um, was the Super Bowl last year was in San Francisco, right? Tons of water there last year, right? Now it snowed for them, thankfully, but they all made um, commercials. And uh, the task was, and this week, again, is for my class the week that they study, we study food and water. So the premise of my class is we do a sort of a machine gun style review of environmental science, because we assume that Steve and formerly Kelly Kaler were teaching everybody everything they need to know in terms of the statistics to scare the pants off of them to make them want to do something about it. And then I come along and try and say, hey, let's try and do something, even though it might be crazy. <laughs> So the crazy idea was to make them make a commercial for the Super Bowl, um, and they had to do it by <coughs> explaining some statistic, right, in a way that engages you with it. And Elka Weber earlier, um, I quoted her, I wrote it down, what she said. She said, awareness, um, uh, awareness, right, awareness is not enough, right? Just showing all the statistics and scaring the pants off them doesn't really help in sort of the productive aspect. And I agree completely that it is highly likely that really bad things are going to happen. But I am uh, someone who also grew up on a farm. <laughs> and somehow maybe that makes us optimists because you kind of grow things and it feels good. Um, but I'm also more than a farmer. I'm a bike mechanic, so I'm into functional things. So this is sort of a group of three things I'll show you. Hopefully it show up. Super Bowl 
50 in 2016, the California Avocado Commission predicted that 139.4 million pounds of avocados would be consumed. In Mexico, where most avocados consumed on Super Bowl Sunday will come from, one pound of avocados takes 31.9 gallons of water to produce. That means that on Super Bowl Sunday, 4.4 billion gallons of water will have been used to produce enough guacamole to satisfy football fans. In San Francisco, 94.85 million avocados were consumed in 2013. That means that 3 billion gallons of water were used to produce these avocados. While it takes 74.1 gallons of water per pound to grow avocados in California and only 31.9 gallons per pound to grow avocados in Mexico, it takes 96.8 gallons of water per pound to grow avocados in Chile. Most of the avocados consumed in the U.S. come from Mexico. Due to the limited avocado season in California and their recent record-breaking droughts, Nevertheless, many avocados consumed in the U.S. throughout the year are imported from Chile and cause issues in the distribution and availability of water in central Chile. So the next one is a little more Super Bowl style.
indeed, drink responsibly and sustainably. It's kind of the message. So I think the takeaway here is right. Awareness can be communicated in ways that aren't necessarily de dependent on data alone. And working in the architecture uh, school, as well as with many designers, understanding how design plays a role in influencing what people choose to do um, is, I think, a big thing that I even overlook in my day-to-day -day operations in applied science and engineering and, and thinking uh, critically and analytically about things and sort of taking for granted that uh, everybody that bought a Prius made a very bad economic decision because the payback on its fuel efficiency is not worth how much more you pay for it at all. And there are many other decisions we make along these lines about whether we want to buy food X or food Y. And I'm super, I think it's a, an amazing example of Organic Valley and the things that we've seen today and how really by not just changing the paradigm, but also changing how you communicate to people the importance and the opportunities that maybe some things lie underneath that. But at the same time, having said all that, I also believe um, that we can develop new technologies as well as new systems to address these. So I hope to in the discussion, bring some of that out and think what, see what you guys really think are the, are the underlying driving forces that aren't necessarily the, the statistical and technological ones, but the ones that are really driving us empathetically at our core in terms of design. Yeah. Yeah. For us, and now we'll hear from uh, David Wilco. Uh, thank you very much, Lyndon. So, um, Quite a few years ago, I, I realized that, that my entire professional career and, and much, many, most of the hours of my day, it seems, stemmed from the fact that from the time I was a little kid onward, I was just crazy interested in birds for no known reason, no genetic reason, no environmental reason. There was no one pushing me to do this. It was just one of those strange mutations that uh, <laughs> happened. But as a result, currently, my research focuses on the issue of biodiversity conservation. So I've moved a little bit beyond the bird stuff. To it. But it's, it's all focused on the question, how do we find room for biodiversity in an increasingly crowded, hungry, and warming world? So I've done a lot of work over the years on land use change issues particularly deforestation, which is now and will be, in the coming decades, the biggest threat to biodiversity. Um, and of course, if you look at that, the biggest cause of land use change, the biggest reason forests are cleared, grasslands are plowed under, is for agriculture. Um, and we focused in particular, I should say, in Southeast Asia, where in the last couple of decades, over half of the tropical forests destroyed in Indonesia and Malaysia have been destroyed to plant oil palm, which is the key ingredient in an almost limitless number of food products and to a lesser extent in things like cosmetics, industrial lubricants, and also uh, a growing crop for biofuel. <coughs> Um, so, because of my concern for biodiversity, I've been concerned about land use change, and whenever I look closer at what's driving land use change, it's almost invariably connected to agriculture, if we include creating pasture lands as part of agriculture, which I think we should. Uh, in terms of teaching, that I've done in Princeton. I, for about 15 years, I taught our Fundamentals of Environmental Studies course. Uh, I'm currently co-teaching a course here in the Woodrow Wilson School on the science and policy of the environment. I'll be teaching conservation biology and EEB starting in the fall. And through the teaching experiences I've had here, I've come to realize that uh, food is a really powerful mode of entry into the topic of environmental change for students. Primarily because all students eat. And when you think about it, they eat in groups 
often in relaxed settings where there's a lot of casual conversation. But very few students have thought a lot about what they're eating beyond what that particular food is, but thought about the environmental implications of it. So it's often really quite an eye-opening experience for them, and it's one of the few ways that they get see a direct connection between their actions and what is happening in different parts of the world. And it's one of the few things that they may casually but frequently communicate in casual conversations with their peers. So it's, it's a wonderful way to get involved uh, in this issue. And in terms of my own teaching on this, I, I try to do two things. Uh, the first is, exactly as Steve indicates, make them see the big picture. Make them understand just how important food agriculture is to a whole suite of really critical environmental issues. Um, the second is to, again, build that set of uh, insights on how their individual actions and similar actions by other people when aggregated across nations leads to a whole range of important uh, environmental problems and conflicts. And I try to avoid two things. The, the first is the sense of hopelessness that it's easy to feel about some of these issues. Uh, but the second is also that sort of myopic optimism that if you had one less meat meal per week, then you're a hero of the planet. Um, and it's an attempt to help students uh, find the right balance of concern and action. Uh, and so I usually then encourage them to act locally in the context of trying to improve their own environmental behavior uh, through things like diet, transportation, and such. Become national advocates because these issues cannot be solved simply by everyone having one less meat meal per week or doing a better job recycling. Of course, if no one does that, we're in a lot of trouble. But we still need to see action at national levels. And in the process of becoming a national activist, which you can do by joining NGOs, getting involved with them, that sort of thing, uh, career choices you make, uh, always trying to maintain that global perspective so that you can properly uh, adjust your activities and be a supporter or an opponent of national policies in a way that we hope will cumulatively allow us to make progress on what Steve uh, has rightly identified as a wickedly complex and difficult set of problems that do seem to be converging uh, with alarming speed. Okay, well thank you for the, uh, each of your contributions. And uh, that brings us to the uh, Q&A se uh, session, um, and I encourage everybody up in the audience to uh, bring forward questions. Um, I think I will uh, kick it off with a question of my own. And so uh, as I introduced the panel, I was talking about um, what it needs to, what we need to do to, you know, build on Princeton's strengths as an interdisciplinary institution to um, develop this sort of coherent pro uh, program of food studies to tackle these types of wicked problems, as you might say. And so I think I'm, I'm curious what each of you think is a contribution that has already been made to date, that is something unique Princeton has contributed, or people, or someone at Princeton has contributed to uh, this, making a step towards solving this wicked problem. And I'd like, uh, you know, I'd perhaps start with you, Forrest, and then we'll sure. <clears throat> move down. So um, in uh, in my class, and I'm sure in, in Steve's now, this year you have, I mean, every major. I, mean, I, have, I have had, I think, up to 25 different majors in one year of, of my class. And so from the student level, um, going through these topics and having the perspective of econ majors, policy majors, along with mechanical engineers and history majors, and the full gauntlet of, of interests 
is really, I think, where the, the opportunity begins, and you have those discussions and try and understand how to connect with those people on their various specific interests as concentrators in those fields. And then taking that away and, and having to work also in the research domain, and I'm in a particularly unique situation of being the, uh, one of the few people who's jointly appointed between the applied sciences and the humanities department. And so going back and forth between these, those two domains and setting up projects that uh, can try and link some of those uh, expertise and opportunities is really rewarding in the sense that many times, even at Princeton where we're uniquely able, due to the smaller size of the campus, to connect between those places, um, it's really rewarding to bring people together that aren't necessarily aware where their two perspectives and two very high levels of expertise can be married in a way that can, can contemplate a problem differently. So this happens, you know, even in very simple things in architecture where um, we have people that really want to do urban farming, right? It's a very popular, I'd almost say, trendy topic. Um, but there's people like um, Steve Dubner, he's a Freakonomics show if you haven't read the book, but he has a podcast going over calculating exactly how much value is in a tomato you grow on your balcony in New York City. Does anybody know what it was? $500 a tomato. And, and then bringing in the social component of that with, in terms of urban studies, right, if you're growing a $500 tomato, sure that sounds terrible, but there's an enormous value to educating people about agriculture, and that's where, you know, there, there's an, an argument in terms of not just doing those technical calculations and the efficiency calculations and how much solar radiation does the wall get and how many things can I grow in an urban space, but really the fact that people don't know that meat is dead animals anymore, right, which was brought up earlier, like 50 years ago, you would go to a butcher shop and there'd be dead animals hanging around, and these days you never ever experience that anymore. And so even just to that level, and sort of the level of removal we have in our urban society, and the fact that now since 2011, 2007, more people live in urban spaces than rural, it's a real issue in terms of the change of culture, and that dynamic is something I think we can bridge through interdisciplinarity and try and educate each other and, and utilize each other's expertise. Okay, thank you. Steve. Yeah, so the, um, at Princeton, of course, we don't have an ag school, and so um, we don't have the same sort of intensive focus on, on uh, uh, production technologies for food that, that some institutions do. But um, we are good at, at, at a lot of it, uh, environmental work anyway. And as I just tr tried to show you, the, 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 the sad fact is, um, that uh, our generation has bequeathed to the next generation a set of interlinked problems that can't be solved separately. And so in a very real sense, if you work to solve the climate problem, you're also working to solve the food problem, all right? Uh, because you reduce the amount of, de of the decrease in rainfall and, um, and so on. These problems all constrain one another. Um, on the on the teaching side, um, and so, so at Princeton, just to sort of tie the knot around that, we have uh, fantastic uh, resources to research climate change. Uh, probably the best in the world, in part because we're co-located with one of the roughly six big government labs that are able to build a modern Earth system model. You couple that to the strength of the university that's been there for, for 50 years, and, and you really have an unfair advantage over our sister institutions. Um, we also have um, uh, 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 quite a bit of expertise on the biodiversity side. Uh, we have uh, had historically and still do spectacular expertise on the hydrology side. And uh, we have some growing expertise on the food side, but not in the sort of core production technologies associated with food. Um, that I think is a consequence of our not being a land grant. On the teaching side, I like Forrest, um, really think there are a lot of opportunities there. I'm, the course I'm teaching currently has north of 250 students in it. It's a first time course. If you poll the students, which I did on the first day, the distribution of majors is essentially flat. It's not a constant, you know, there's many art majors as there are engineers, as there are uh, uh, social scientists and that sort of thing. Um, the course is designed, I think it's the first one like it, so that you can, by taking different flavors of precept, it's a very complicated course, you can get a distribution requirement in science with a laboratory, in math, that is the quant one, 
science without a laboratory, social analysis, which includes economics, arts and literature, or ethics. All right, so there are six different distribution requirements of seven that you can fulfill by just taking this one course. So that's pretty good. <laughs> it's certainly good marketing. And, and uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So a, a, a number, a few years ago, I, I had a meeting with the dean of the faculty. She asked me where I thought Princeton ought to really try to expand what sort of new vistas should we be uh, heading towards. And I said, well, agriculture. From the look in her eye, I began to realize if she had a button to a trap door <laughs> under my seat, I think she would have pressed it. But, but the argument I made was that it's too important an issue for us not to be involved. And when I think about where Princeton can make a unique contribution, where in many ways it has, it lies in, in, in the curious fact that Princeton is a small research university, which means we don't have huge numbers of specialists that can sort of cover everything from how to grow corn better to how to market um, uh, meatless products, which you might find in a lot of universities. We have a, a, a diverse faculty and almost no barriers uh, to collaboration. And you see it all the time across all manner of disciplines, faculty members from different disciplines getting together and tackling problems from a, a multidisciplinary perspective. And that's exactly what we need to tackle this interrelated set of environmental problems that certainly has food as a central driving component. So there's an enormous opportunity for Princeton to make the sorts of contributions that very few other institutions can make. And we've done it in the past on issues, and I think we could do, do so even more in the future um, albeit with, with uh, some additional people and resources to sort of uh, catalyze that process. Okay. Can you, I'm just curious, if you, you mentioned some of the past issues. Where do you feel some of the past issues are that we've made that contribution already? So I think um, we've done some really exciting work on the whole climate change front. Uh, there's no doubt about it in terms of understanding not only the scientific dimensions of climate change, but also uh, what the uh, social, political ramifications are. I think you see it in terms of our um, understanding of land use change. Really, a lot of people, not a lot relative to many other places, but a lot for Princeton, interested in this topic, working at it often, combining different types of scientific research, working out some of the social dimensions of it. And um, th those are the two examples that I'm most familiar with, where, where I just feel as though our, our contributions as an institution uh, stand out and have been particularly helpful and insightful. Okay. Good. Thank you. Someone has finally stepped forward to the microphones. Yeah, I, I would like to make a comment I want to carry on the discussion. Um, everything we, we heard right now. So um, for us to talk about urban farming, and I just saw that that was the opportunity for me to maybe speak on the mic. Um, so I think Princeton actually have a very great power compared to other university to uh, solve the problem that Steve was talking about, the fact that land use and the amount of land on, in the world is not extending, and we have to increase the yield by that many percent. Um, and I talk about that this morning. And I do think that there is a solution. And the solution is exactly what you talk about, which is urban farming and vertical farming. And I think Princeton is actually the only place in the world where we have great minds in all the different disciplines that can come together and find a solution on how to make 
your tomato that you say costs five hundred dollar to a normal tomato cost just by thinking of how to make architecture better and make it efficient and sustainable, how to make technology not so expensive of using people to collect these these vegetables, and how to make uh, plants maybe better, or what plant can we do? And also, so earlier we talked about the um, the amount of water used for uh, growing plants or to do your barley things and everything. And I do agree that it costs a lot, but to give you an example of vertical farm, um, some of the company, company are growing now in New York. And I have to say that on 90 companies that have been created last year, 80 already closed down. And the reason is just because they don't break even, because we don't teach them how to do it. They don't really know how to do it. So, but I do think that if we do it in Princeton, we can be already on the top, and we can do it. So with this introduction, I, uh, with a group of students, I initiated uh, a few months ago um, a project called Princeton Vertical Farming. And uh, we will be building a small um, pilot project here in Princeton, where students can come from different disciplines. I hope to have architects, engineers, uh, biologists, economists, and uh, all of that to study all the different barriers that stop us to do so. And the reason of that is just because you have been shown, many studies show, that if we grow plants vertically with different layers of plants and not necessarily in a greenhouse, it could be just in a building like this, with LEDs that are very cheap now, we can multiply the yield by three and on just 1% of the land. So if we manage to do that efficiently and sustainability, then we have a solution for the future. And we don't need to, to wait 33 years. We just need people to invest in it deeply and make the things happening. And I hope that this small project uh, will actually make roots to a lot of students and startups and things that will happen. And um, I hope a lot of faculty will get involved. Okay. All right, that falls under the technology uh, solution. Yeah, thing, perhaps. But thank, thanks yeah, for that. I mean, uh, but but just to re so Paul is a is a is a good friend of mine. But but uh, and I believe that vertical farms will end up being a niche market. But if the demand for um, food is growing by um, tens of percent, seventy percent, sixty percent, they become close to doubling. Then um, we're going to have and and people don't shift their diets dramatically. Then we need to raise food for a animals. And, and, and sort of 1.6 billion hectares worth, and you're never gonna get that out of vertical farms. Just isn't enough verticality to do it. I do think that, that um, uh, there'll be niche markets, especially for vegetables, but I can't imagine uh, growing grain in that way. Okay. Thanks. Yes, please. Talking about Princeton's influence in agriculture, um, I come from a Princeton family. My husband is class of 66. Uh, his dad had a big farm on Route 1, it was an apple orchard called Mount Farms, and is now Canal Point and everything that's been developed out there. And his dad said, if you can go to Princeton, you've got to go because you'll be smart. You can stay on the farm and just, if you go to Princeton, you can figure out how to farm after that. And indeed, that's what happened over the time. One of the things I think we've sort of missed on this whole discussion, although it's been absolutely fabulous, especially the one that my daughter was the moderator for, <laughs> uh, is the land use issues. And so we bought our farm down the road at a gigantic cost um, and because we could convince all these banks to give us money, and why not? They just kept giving it to us. Then, unfortunately, we figured out we had to pay it back. But over time, then, we decided this is not sustainable for people. You cannot start farming if you don't already own the land or something. And so he started the Farmland Preservation Program in New Jersey which is where the government comes together, state and local government. There are committees on every, in every county that plan out what farmland should be preserved and map it all out, and they talk to all the farmers, know who owns which land. And then the, oh, as a voluntary operation, people sell their development rights to the government. And then you're deed restricted forever against being able to develop. You have to give up your future megabucks, whatever that might be, because you want to preserve your land for, and for us, we are in perennial crops, and we don't want to 
if we're planting a tree now, it could last 100 years. We don't want to have to sell it out for some big dollars later. It's not our thing. So, but amazingly enough, even in this country, and then been very powerful in New Jersey, we have now 350, 400,000 acres of preserved farmland in New Jersey, bought by the, the taxpayers over and over again, deciding that they want their tax money to go to preserving farmland. And, but many places in this country do not have a program like this. Many states, most states. Very unique here in, the, in New Jersey. And my view is that, yes, we're going to have to have a lot of land. But if we would preserve the land that we already have in a commitment from the public, we wouldn't have to cut down lots of trees other places. There's a lot of land that's not being used well, that has no future for them. And the guys who own it now are old like me, and they go like, I'm selling, I'm going to Florida, whatever. And so immediately, who's going to buy it? Well, somebody who wants to put a shopping center. So if, if a policy, if there was one policy and one law that we came out of here with, I think that some kind of land use decisions about preserving land for the future, for agriculture, is key to the whole follow-up. And that came from a Princeton graduate. Well, can I, can, I, can I follow up with you, actually? I'm, I'm curious. So since we're talking about Princeton's role in things, mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on uh, uh, how this university would contribute to something like that, uh, whether it's you know, local in, in New Jersey or, uh, or more nationally. And uh, do you see a role for this university, or is that more of a Rutgers thing? A state no, it's not a Rutgers thing. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm curious we know as state workers are have a hard time doing, you know, really innovative stuff. As uh, genuine as they all are, it's very, very difficult to, and certainly Rutgers was involved in some of this farmland, but well, we really, that was not. I think that a university like Princeton, where innovation in uh, crit critical thinking is engendered and celebrated and all that um, is the place for something that is unique and interesting to come out of it. And uh, the education people get here allows them to be risk takers. And that is what you have to you have to know how to be able to surprise, so to sustain an effort and, and take risk. And once you go, once you have the connections here, you can go to Washington in a minute and call up everybody and they, things happen. So that's a, it's a sort of a policy type of connection you're talking about. Well, I think maybe you need a land use more. Maybe you need the Department of your Department of Agri uh, the Architecture beefs up their land use uh, department. Or land use is a big thing. I mean, it's a very big issue. And uh, more and more people say, okay, we're all going to be living in cities, but cities in climate change are going to be unlivable. They're so hot, they're going to be, like, totally difficult to live in. But look at our town. Lawrence Township used to be, when it, during the Revolution, it was all farmland. There were no trees. It was all land. It was, that's why the Revolutionary War was fought there, because we could feed all those soldiers romping up and down. Now we have so many trees, we have to start cutting them down because there are too many trees. Okay. So it depends on how what your land use uh, ordinances are. What, are you going to allow another shopping center, or are you going to encourage a farm? All right. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Gordon. Steve, it seems to me that, uh, I don't know if you consider this in your course, but there's another component to this nexus of food and water and climate change and loss of biodiversity, and it seems to me that's human health. It was asserted this morning, for example, that um, climate change is really a public health problem it, from, from one point of view, and we know that... Uh, you know, diet, the amount of red meat, the amount of uh, animal fat, et cetera, in the diet has adverse effects on human health. And if you were to change that to more plant-based, it might be beneficial, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's a lot of health problem interwoven into the kinds of things you're talking about. So I wondered if you incorporate that in your course. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of discussion of the um, interaction of these various problems with human health. I view that as, uh, you know, a dimension of these problems rather than human health being a nexus problem per se. There's no, 
forecast, I think, that's reasonable to make that says that human, the crisis in human health, the gap between healthy and unhealthy is going to be reach its maximum extent at mid-century or something like that, right? So I think human health is an ongoing concern, and, and it will be until we're immortal, and then we're really screwed, right? So, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And so, uh, well, so so th uh, that's it. One of the most interesting dimensions, I think. And if you're if you're looking for something fun to read that's in the scientific literature, there's a group of of resource economists at Berkeley who have made enormous strides in predicting the link between climate and violence. And. So much so that, that uh, already something like 30% of sub-Saharan conflict, interstate conflict, is caused by food shortages from the changes in the hydrologic cycle from fossil fuels to date, and that number is to climb to over 50% by 2030, all right, just around the corner. And in the United States, there is a, just a shocking relationship between murder and rape and violence and, and uh, extreme weather having to do that, that is exacerbated by climate change. So, so uh, take a look at this. There's a review by Carlton et al. That starts with a C, October in Science. Just look it up on the web and read it. It'll scare the devil out of you. So, yeah, you I just want to make a, there's a Princeton plug behind what you just said. One of those, one of those people was a postdoc here that's been doing a lot of that climate. That, that's right. So, so the, 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 the sub-Saharan conflict work is a former postdoc of Mike Oppenheimer's, right? right? Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, please. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm going to make a, uh, well, first a comment and then a question. But first, I want to make a comment in relation to talking about preserved farmland. I'm actually here along with uh, the other farmers that I farm with. We're actually got a new property on Cherry Valley Road in Princeton which I'm sure some people around here have probably seen it going up. Um, and that was preserved farmland. And, you know, we're all under the age of 30, and, you know, we needed the help of a private investor to make that happen. But we were very thankful that it was preserved, because otherwise, like, land like that, I mean, hardly exists in this area anymore. And most of it is not in any sense of a meaningful production. A lot of it's just corn or soy or kind of just feral fields from, you know, once upon a time when the Dutch settlers used it uh, a lot more frequently. So... I thought that was a really important point to bring up. And then two, my question is more in relation to, um, I guess I want to talk about how uh, a lot of this comes out of a book I'm currently reading called Last Child in the Woods. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that or read that book. But the general idea is about how our, especially kids and younger generations, you know, pretty much the millennial generation starting from the 80s, has very little connection to nature. And they're kind of living this urban mechanized life that's completely devoid of any... Uh, real connection and engagement with nature. They're observers, and they're not actually uh, doing anything with it. And also, we have a problem, I guess, of intellectualization of nature. Like, we, we learn about it and understand a lot about it, but we don't actually uh, engage with it, is one of the other big points of the book. Um, and I wanted to know if anyone has any thoughts on how, kind of like, solving that part of the puzzle in terms of either bringing green spaces into urban landscapes, connecting children with natural settings and getting them off the devices and whatnot, whether or not that'll actually, because from as I understand, and a lot of us people that grew up with farms or lived on farms or are farmers, you know, maybe we're just romantics, but we f see that there's something very powerful about being connected to the land. And I think a lot of our food choices come out of that and that a lot of people with no other sense of uh, engagement other than just education and you know they, they know the information but it doesn't mean anything to them emotionally on a deeper level and so they don't make those choices and if we do get people in touch then maybe that will be the kind of you know um, what was the word you used before talking about uh, you know just a complete unprecedented shift in uh, and you know a green revolution so to say that we need in order to save, save the planet more or less. Can I, can I answer, uh, respond to that in, in, in a narrow way, uh, and then others may, may want to build in different directions, which is this. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with you that that sort of firsthand experience with either nature or uh, a suite of environmental problems, it, it, it doesn't have to necessarily be a positive experience, but that first experience is critical. So uh, I have a joint appointment in the Woodrow Wilson School here and in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. 
In EEB, students can elect to spend a semester in either Panama or Kenya. They go and do that. They are immersed in a whole suite of experiences, issues related to nature, related to human relationships with nature, and it's very often transformative for them. The problem is now maybe 15 to 20 percent of our majors in EEB choose to do that. The other 80, 85 percent, they can probably get their degree without ever actually having to step off the campus. Uh, and I think one of the things that not only EEB but the university as a whole should be thinking about is more of these, is finding ways to build more, for want of a better word, just field trips, short experiences to get students off the campus, to put them into new environments that will expose them to either uh, a natural world that they may not have spent much time in or never been with someone who knows a lot about that, or up hand, up close and personal with some interesting environmental issues, whether it's our food systems or our energy production. And I think it, it, it requires a change in the way we think about education here. But if we do that change, we are uh, a university with, 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 uh, that's fortunately wealthy. We could do that. And I think it would make a big difference. Uh, thanks, uh, Zoe. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so you each uh, mentioned earlier uh, the technological silver bullet that might come along and solve the whole nexus. And I'd be interested to hear, um, to hear each of you comment on um, if you had to make a bet where you think that silver bullet might be coming from. Uh, bicycles? Like, what, what, what direction? Yeah, well, let me begin by saying I don't believe in silver bullets. I think it's, it's, it's an aggregate of a lot of changes, some technological, some social, some economic, that uh, ultimately begin to tackle these problems. But, but that's, that's, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of a Luddite. So. And, I've, and in my own area, I've seen too many people have silver bullet solutions that uh, did not pan out. Yeah, I mean, it's the, it's the fact that nobody... Nobody saw the iPhone coming. These are the, I mean, that's the kind of mode you have to think in, how much your life has changed because of these things that weren't really predicted. Um, and uh, um, there's this great um, essay, As We May Think, by, um, now I'm blanking on the, from 19, the 1950s, um, about how computers could change the world and how many things they got right it was super interesting, but how many things are different than what they predicted? We often celebrate how well certain people predicted things changing in the future, um, but in fact, what I don't think we celebrate enough is how many things were unpredictable because we like saying we predicted things right so that we can again say we're predicting what will happen, but I don't think we accept enough that things will change not the way we've predicted them. And there, that there aren't silver bullets, but later, when we look back on the iPhone, it was a silver bullet of media and of social media, right? And or smartphones in general, right? And so I think that's the. I mean, that I think it's not really there, but that there's latent potential for something. I'm, I'm not going to give up on that because I'm going to remain an optimist. That's right. I get one more question. Yeah. So um, I think there is a silver bullet for the climate problem. Um, I, I, and it's because of a bunch of other innovations that have happened since. Um, I think we're poised uh, on, the, uh, on the precipice of an all-electric, for, for almost all-electric economy. And the, the innovation, and it's because of the continued buy-down in the cost of photovoltaics and wind that shows no sign of abating. Um, and, and I spend quite a bit of time looking at battery technologies, you know, even sign NDAs and go and, and look at them. And, and uh, there are some, a bunch of companies that are, that are coming in now with $100 a kilowatt hour installed. You get to 50 and this whole thing is over. All right, so. I think we have time for uh, just maybe this one and one, maybe one more, please. Thank you. I've really enjoyed this panel. Um, 
just uh, underscoring, we are at peak oil, peak water, peak land, our populations are growing and our demands of resources are obviously growing as well, so that's a happy picture. But it's not uh, necessarily something that needs a solution for us to solve a problem, but actually for a challenge for us to rise to. And I'd like to thank everybody in this room because there are the skills and the tools and the understanding here to deal with this problem in its entirety. Um, we're looking at shifts in, looking, uh, in consumption to plant-based. I work with large supermarkets who are saying 45% of consumers now are looking towards more plant-based proteins. So that is a massive shift. This isn't a trend. This is what's happening. We look at what the solutions, using that horrible word, actually are. We know that they are to be soil stewards. We know that they are to have three-dimensional growing systems, as Mark talks about, so that we're massively increasing the land. We know that that increased yield, and um, we need to do that at scale, which is what you're saying. So then having ecological systems thinkers on this panel is so important because what Princeton needs to be truly churning out are people who think in terms of systems and to understand the way that the ecological system works, but then to apply it to public policy is extraordinary because our biggest challenges to the four or $500 tomato is that the externalization of costs, that three-dimensional growing systems and ecological systems are not cost-effective. They're not cost-effective because we're hemorrhaging money and we're hemorrhaging resources that are not being calculated into our food system. So if you're able to bring all of these people together and really, you know, in an extended conversation, have experts and students really solve this, we can do it. it we've got all of it here. Uh, actually, just on, on that, Princeton does not, unfortunately, have an accounting school. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a feeling that there are students who would be interested in looking at that as part of their additional research. Okay, it's an important point, though, on the accounting thing. It's one I think about a lot, and thank you for raising it. Thank yeah. you. Uh, one more, and I think we have to... Well, I was just going to... Uh, uh, I wanted to offer a little comment so that everyone didn't hear Steve's presentation and go throw themselves off the cliff. Uh, and I, I'm thrilled that uh, I'm, I, because of Steve's presentation, I'm no longer the single most pessimistic person in the, in the room. So just two thoughts on that. Uh, uh, three. One is that, um, you know, on the consumption side, there really is not a silver bullet, but a silver opportunity. And that is the fact that more or less 40% of all of our wet enough productive land, whether it's in grazing or cropping, is to produce beef. And that produces 2% of global calories. So the, uh, you know, that is why we have emphasized the reduction in ruminant meat, because it actually provides an extraordinarily small amount of, of consumption, and it takes up an extraordinarily large amount of resources. So that's why we've emphasized we have to find those easier opportunities. A second thing is, while I completely agree that you know, if you're going to produce 70% more food on the same land, you've got to have 70% more yield. But it's not always um, industrial. And so in grazing land, for example, most of the world's uh, feed for ruminants is still going to come from grass. I mean, that's most of the... No, I don't think so. It's calories. Well, it's, it, but that's the point. It's most of the world's... Um, it will still be the case that most of the world's productive farmland is producing grass for animals. And more intensive management of grazing operations, which is not, doesn't look like a normal industrial operation, is part of the improvement. So it's not always just going into pouring in chemicals. There are, there are lots of those opportunities. Okay. And uh, just the last thing, there's an advertisement. So we will have, um, as part of our five, six year WRI project, we will have in the next few months our wedges on how you actually get to the promised land. And it requires some consumption changes, uh, it requires tremendous intensification of production and improvements and some technological breakthroughs. Uh, but when I look at it, and it's, as a political matter, it's kind of hard to imagine us getting our act together to do it. But as a technological and economic matter, it's within the same range as the, as the uh, um, energy issues. So it's kind of maybe harder politically, but actually kind of from the pure technology and ec economic standpoint, probably in the same ballpark. So I'll keep that as an advertisement. All right, last word to Rosalie, please. I just quickly wanted to address Professor Wilkov's point about how we need to make um, students more engaged. I wanted to say that I think there already is a lot of sort of grassroots movement in that direction. For example, the freshman seminar, Science Society and Dinner that we had last spring, we had Madeline and Daniel in that, and we had a lot of hands-on experience with food, understanding the complexity of food systems. We got out to the farms, we learned about 
um, soil restoration and recovery, we saw how things that we eat are made. And I think um, that's how we got Madeline and Daniel on the Princeton Studies Food team. So I think there are issues, I mean, there are initiatives like that. The Office of Sustainability is doing trips. Dining hall is, the din dining services are showing students where their food is sourced from. So there definitely are these things. We just need to figure out how to scale them up and make them an essential component of the curriculum, not just a side issue. So just wanted to make that comment. All right, now we're over time, but thank you very much to the panelists and to everybody. <laughs>